Hello everyone and welcome to another with Electronic ISIS webinar. My name is Markus Eberle and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is Anticipate EMC with LT Spice. Our speaker today is Sylvain Lebrun, who is working as field application engineer at Wolf Electronic ISAS. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. As we also take all possible steps against the coronavirus, we are unfortunately not sitting in the same rooms today, but are holding the webinar out of the home office. In case of any tech technical issues or some delay, please take this into account. We will do our best to make a smooth process possible. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. Today's webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. There are 10 to 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. If you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isis-webinar at we-online.com. We will try to answer all questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our webinars. If you want to download the presentation, you can do it with the download section in the webinar control panel. Also, you will receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of the webinar in the next few weeks. Now I want to hand over to our speaker, Silver, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Okay. Thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. And um, let's get started because we are already um, having a very short time to have this presentation, which is usually one hour and 30 minutes. So feel free to ask uh, any question you like, and I will take the time to answer, even if it's not during the live session. Thank you. And let's get started. Okay, today we're going to anticipate our EMC with LT Spice. So this means that we're going to see the introduction, something that you're already doing every day, which is the time-based simulation. Uh, most of the time you get into a functional simulation. So we're gonna take a few steps that you already know probably and show you how we can make this step compatible with something which is EMC accurate and how we can get the data that will make our, present, our simulations relevant. We're gonna also see examples of what is not making the simulation relevant when you don't take um, when you don't take precautions, and then we're going to see what is the keystone to enable the EMC measurement in LT Spice, and to get really accurate, um, we're going to compare actual measurements done in an EMC lab together with measurements that we will do with LT Spice. If you are interested in getting the simulation files, they will be available in download uh, later. Just drop us an email if you want. And we're going to see um, things that you most of the time are not able to do into the EMC lab and that you will be able to do within a few seconds uh, using LT Spice. So let's get started and let's get the tools ready first. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the tools that I will be using is LT Spice, obviously, which is now part of analog devices. So you can still download the latest version, which has been recently updated in 2017. The other tool I will be using to provide EMC accurate data to my 
simulation model is Red Expert. Red Expert is a kind of data sheet 2.0. It really enables me to have um, all the parasitic elements, which are very important when it comes to EMC simulation. The first step today will be something you might already know. It's just a functional simulation, time-based most of the time, of the ripple from a bug. So you already know LTSpice if you are here, and you know that LTSpice enables you to go from the selected IC to a simulable model within minutes. It's really very helpful for the designer. You may tell your boss that you need a few days to do the simulation, but still, you only need a few clicks to get to a running um, test fixture. This test fixture is the one I opened just by left clicking on the on right clicking on the device and opening uh, the macro model test fixture. So now that I have my macro model test fixture, if I want to to get into the understanding uh, of the ripple voltage at the output, for example. Um, I can use a simulation or I can use some hardcore mathematics. Yeah, it's not that hardcore, but still, if I want to know the output ripple of a buck, the only thing I've got to do is to use the Ohm's law. So the ripple voltage here at the output of a buck, for example, equals the impedance of a capacitor at the frequency, at the given frequency, multiplied by the ripple current. These two informations can be provided by LTSPICE, but to enable an easy, an easy, um, sorry, I'm a bit too fast. To enable an easy selection of the components, you can also use a Red Expert. Red Expert for me is just a node to laziness, like LTSPICE is, because you can get to a macro model test feature very fast. So here, I'm able to have the impedance of my capacitor and the ripple current of my buck within seconds. So here, for example, the impedance of my capacitor at the switching frequency, which is 800 kilohertz here, is just given directly in the software. And the ripple current of my buck, once I have inputted the parameters in here, is given just here. So this means that I will be able to start um, anticipating the, the ripple of my buck. But what we can see here is that Red Expert is providing you more information. You see the shape of the curve is very different when you go from one capacitor to another. Here, it's the example, we can get the ESR versus the frequency. And here we can see that the curve is going up again here. This comes from the fact that we've got some ESL, equivalent series impedance in the capacitor. And when it's come to EMC, it's more important to care about this area than it is actually to care about the actual capacitance value. Here is the example, the screenshot of the, um, of the buck converter tool, and it gives you directly the ripple current here, and together with a lot of other parameters. So here, if we want to use Red Expert, we use it to extract to extract EMC accurate data from Red Expert tool. Here, in my presentation, I would like to ask you to consider using a split model. For example, instead of using a single capacitor in your presentation, if you really want to understand what is the key point to improve the EMC behavior of your device, to improve the ripple of your device, it's really to take this capacitor and break, in the, break it down into three elements, explicitly showing the parasitics of the capacitor. You can directly extract this data from the curve in Red Expert. Here is an example with a film capacitor here. Um, by using the impedance equation of the ESL, I managed to have here the value of the ESL of this capacitor. So this means that I can then take this eight nano Henry and feed, the, feed them into my model. On the other end, for example, using a low, imp low parasitic impedance technology such as ceramic capacitor will enable me to, for example, fit a much lower value, first reducing the impedance, the contribution of the ESL in my simulation. So what's wrong? with the macro model test fixture. 
This is the output voltage ripple that comes from the macro model test fixtures. Unfortunately, here in the model, a lot of data is not filled in, and some data which is existing is just fitted with zero. So this means that this capacitor will never have a parasitic ESL behavior. So this model, for example, is not useful for EMC simulation. Look at the shape of the curve right now. It's just very smooth and it looks like a rectified sinusoid wave. But when you do the simulation with a real model, here is what you end up with. For your reference, this was before, this is now. So this means that if you want to do some EMC accurate simulation, you really have to care about the parasitics. Here, the parasitics are splitted. So this is what I talked about before. Here, I've broken down the contribution of each and every element. So for example, here you've got the charge and the discharge of the capacitor. We're using the same scale. That's 30 millivolt from the bottom to the top of both of the screens. So here you see that the contribution when it comes to the ripple voltage of the charge of the capacitor and the discharge of the capacitor is roughly the same as the, as the contribution that comes just from the ESR. And even if you consider the ESL at low frequency, there is a 10 millivolt peak to peak ripple. At higher frequency, then we go to a much higher um, contribution in the ripple if we consider this big spike in here. So I just want to show you how important it is. Later in the presentation, I just give you a little overview. But here, for example, it's the result of, of breaking down the contribution in frequency of a single capacitor and its elements. So here you see that the ESR is bringing more EMC trouble than, its actual, than the capacitance value. And the ESL is just contributing a lot of the, per, of, the, of the EMI into the high frequency range. So here, as many designers, what we do, we increase the capacitance value when we, we see the ripple is not good. But if we consider the high frequency, increasing the capacitance value will not change a lot of things. So I hope that you have now in mind the importance of the parasitics when it comes to EMC simulation. But now, what is the missing link? What is missing in LTSPICE to enable the EMC measurement? So it's the same thing as in an actual EMC lab. For conducted emissions, what is the keystone of, conduct of conducted emissions? It's the line impedance stabilization network. And what is exactly this device? A line impedance stabilization network is a device that enables you to power your device while listening to the, to the emissions that is sending. So here, inside this device, we've got two low-pass filters. These low-pass filters enables the power to go to your device, but they prevent the high frequency from escaping. Here, what is happening, the high frequency um, is the signal, the low frequency is the power, and we want to listen to this signal. So what we're doing is we capture the voltage created by this high frequency, both line A and line B, and we send it to an EMI receiver. So an EMI receiver is another way of, say, of saying um, spectrum analyzer, but EMI receiver is just used for the EMI compliance. So in this EMI receiver, we then compare the amount of signal at each frequency with a specific limit. That's the very essence of EMC. So what is enabling the EMC measurement in real life and in LTSPICE? It's the model of line impedance stabilization network. So if we implement a very basic version of this line, line um, line impedance stabilization network into LDSPICE. And if we do an FFT of the input voltage here, we are already starting to get some results that we are familiar with if we're going to the EMC lab. 
So here, for example, um, I'm just using the bug converter here and doing an FFT over the input voltage. So you can see here, there's nothing more than that. It's very simple simulation. And it's already giving something which is not quite far from an actual measurement. Here is the actual measurement. And here, it should be adding the curve, just a second. So here is the actual measurement. And here is the simulation. So the limit line is not exactly at the same level, but I fitted 60 dB with, together with 60 dB. And this is in green, the simulation. And in yellow at the back, what you can see is the actual measurement. So as you can see, we are already not that far away from between the simulation and the reality. So then what's next? So as I showed you before, you really have to fit the parasitic of each and every element which is significant in your simulation. As soon as you fit all the parasitic elements, you will get something which is very relevant from an EMC point of view. So here, to get really accurate, we have to take into account that an EMI measurement is the sum in unknown proportions of common mode and differential mode. So it's the next step to get seriously accurate with an EMC simulation is to take into account the common mode interference because in the previous simulation we used only the differential mode interference. So we have to make the sum of these two interferences to get to something which is relevant when it comes to EMC simulation. So to understand what we should implement into LT Spice, we have to have a look at an actual LISN design. Here, this line impedance stabilization network design enables you to do some measurements on EMC and to investigate. So here, what you see is the differential mode interference. The differential mode interference is symmetrical. It's the power that gets in and out of your device to power it. On the other end, the common mode interference is traveling into the ground reference plane, is not taking the ways you expect in your schematic. So to implement the same thing as this line impedance stabilization network into LTSPICE, you just have to copy and paste an equivalent model of the LISN. So this is what we're doing in the next simulation steps. And here, for example, what you can see is I have fitted here my regular ground uh, symbol, and I've detached my here my um, the ground the reference uh, point of my uh, my device. So here I'm using the line impedance stabilization network, but this time not in real in LT Spice. The other thing that I have to do when I'm doing the simulation, when I want to do EMC simulation, is to model the ways that the common mode noise is using to couple down into the ground reference plane. So this comes from an old presentation, which is called Keep Calm and Investigate. And here is a metallic plate, which is enabling the, EMC, the common mode interference to loop back to the line impedance stabilization network. So in, the, in this presentation, what we show is that we have two contributions when it comes to common mode. The first contribution is the E-field coupling, the capacitive coupling of IDV over DT signal from the buck switching node down to the ground reference plane, which is just underneath this piece of paper. And the other thing is the contribution of the phone case to the ground reference plane. So here, if I want to do an EMC accurate measurement, I have to be aware of the places where my E-field uh, is coupling down to the ground reference plane. Here, for example, I've added two capacitors, very little value here. You can see it's only 20 picofarads, and here is 100 picofarads. So these two are modeling the E-field coupling uh, towards ground reference plane. You can see here that my ground reference plane is represented here, here, and here. 
and I've detached the ground of my device from the ground reference plane. So here, uh, I wanted to show you something from the previous presentation. It's two measurements uh, made with a spectrum analyzer. So here is the phone lifted from the ground reference plane, and here is the phone on the ground reference plane. So in the first case, when I lift the phone from the ground reference plane, this capacitance value goes down. And this makes this curve look like this. But when the phone is closer to the ground reference plane, what is happening in the conducted emissions is that we have more current, more common mode current flowing into this now big capacitor here. So everything that we have observed into the actual measurement, we can translate it into the simulation. And by doing so, we're able, for example, to reproduce uh, this um, this actual measurement. So this is the actual measurement. There is a few problems here with uh, RBW, but uh, have a look at what is happening in the simulation for the same thing. So basically, we can mimic the behavior of our actual system in the simulation as soon as we know which are the parasitic coupling elements. So here, for example, you can see that it's not far away. We're able to do a simulation just by adding two parasitic couplings into the prison, into the simulation. We can already mimic the behavior of the whole system. So here, for example, in green is the simulation and the image that you see right now at the back in blue and in yellow is the actual measurement performed on an EMC lab. So now, as you can see, it's a bit over the limit and we don't really know, is it common mode, is it differential mode? In the real life, it's quite complicated to split common mode and differential mode. We have to use current probes and everything, but in LTSpice, it's quite convenient. To understand how we can split common mode and differential mode, we have to have a look at the contribution of the, of the differential mode of the differential mode interference and of the common mode interference. So what we can see here is that when we are taking the voltage between the two tips of the SMA connectors here, we are getting twice the differential mode voltage. And as the common mode voltage is flowing in opposite directions and is not symmetrical, it's called asymmetrical interference, then if it's balanced between line and neutral, for example, or between VCC and GND, then we're going to see minus VCM, minus common mode voltage, plus VCM, plus common mode voltage, so almost zero. So basically, we are having twice the differential mode, zero times the common mode. So this means that we are just having a look at the, com at the differential mode interference, for example, here. If we had the voltages between the ground and the tip and the voltage between the ground here and the tip, then this time we're able to extract only the, only the common mode. In the same way, we will be able, by adding the voltages, to have only the common mode voltage. So this is something that can be done just with a few clicks in LTSPICE. By doing this, I just take the voltages on my line impedance stabilization network, the one from the tip, from the top tip and the one from the bottom tip. And here I had the both voltages. So this means that by entering these expressions, I will get only the differential mode and the common mode. Here is what you get from a time-based point of view. And the most important thing for you now is to get into the EMC space, the FFT point of view. So it's just a click away. You click on view, FFT, and then this window will pop up. And you have to read here and to see that Alt double click enables you to enter an, expre an expression. And here, what I want to do is display the FFT of the voltage is here. So the voltage between the two tips here is V analyzer, my uh, comma, V analyzer, analyzer two. 
and a common mode noise is VNalyzer 2 plus VNalyzer. So by doing so, I'm able to split common mode and differential mode. This is something which is very convenient to do in LTSPICE, and it's really helping you to understand where you should take care of the common mode, where you should take care of the differential mode. It's also a very good tool to learn EMC. So here, for example, we've just splitted the common mode and differential mode. We can then scale them just by adding 0.5 here and 0.5 here. So I hope I'm not going too fast, but I saw that I only have a limited amount of time today, only a third of what I used to have. So to make the simulation look real, the next thing we have to do is not use dB volts here, but use dB microvolts. Uh, then when we are doing EMC, we are comparing a signal level together uh, with a limit line. So it's very important for us to be able to load limit lines. And only a very few amount of people are able to do that. At the end of a presentation, you will all be able to do it. And then here you can see we are going from 10 kilohertz up to more than one gigahertz. This is not relevant when it comes to EMC. So now here, what I'm going to do is to take this frequency range down to EMC relevant frequency range. This EMC relevant frequency range will be defined just by a few steps. Here, what you can see is we have one dB volt equals to 120 dB microvolt. So this means that we have just a multiplication by one million. So we have to multiply the signal level by 1 million to make it in dB microvolt. And the other thing we have to do is also to divide it by two. So basically, we are just multiplying the voltages by 500,000. So here, by doing so, we are able to get into um, an EMC relevant curve. So to save, uh, the first thing we have to do if we want to edit um, really all the all the parameters from uh, the FFT view is to save the plot settings files because we are doing manipulations that most of time cannot be done directly into the interface of LTSPICE. These modifications have to be done on the text file which will be saved. So what you have to do now is just to save the plot settings and open it. You will open it with, for example, Notepad. Using Notepad, you can directly change all the parameters in here and add the lines that will make the limit lines in your simulation. So here, for example, um, you can see that I'm adding the limit lines based on the based on the based on the based on the regulations, the EMC limit lines. And here, this line correspond, for example, to this portion on my on my uh, on my viewport. The second line is just this one, etc., etc., etc. So I will I can provide you with this tool if you want. Um, you just have to input the frequency here, the line level, and then it gives you the correct syntax to copy and paste into your um, into your um, into your uh, plot settings. So now that you have edited your plot settings for the limit lines, the next thing you can do is define a relevant uh, a relevant frequency range and a relevant range when it comes to the amplitude of the signal. So here I'm scaling my signal from 10 kilohertz to 30 megahertz and from 0 dB to 120 dB microvolts, which is usually the very same um, the very same viewport as we get into an EMC lab when it comes to conducted emissions. Sometimes it starts at 150 kilohertz. Sometimes it starts at 9 kilohertz. Most of the time, we can cover um, with with this uh, viewport. You can change it and adjust it as you want. And now it really makes the simulation look real. Here is the result um, that you can get uh, from the. Um, here is the result that you can get just from the simulation. So here 
We have the limit, which is displayed directly. We have the differential mode contribution, and we have the common mode contribution splitted. Um, this is a very good starting point to try to fix EMC problems before they actually happen in real life. So that's where I want to show you now that you can use this simulation to understand and to pick the right components um, in your system. So for example, here, I see that the differential mode interference is quite high. It's the highest contribution in my, uh, in my EMC scan at the low frequency, and it's common. So what I will do is I will take care of this differential mode interference. The best thing to take care of uh, about differential mode interference is to use a polymer cap. So now I will switch to a bigger polymer cap with very low equivalent series resistance and very low equivalent series inductance. By doing so, I will be able to lower my differential mode contribution. So here is, you can see what was before I added the polymer cap. And when I had the polymer cap, when I replaced the previous capacitor um, by this polymer cap, for example, I'm bringing the differential mode contribution much lower. You can see that now it's just playing with the limit. So it's a first improvement that we can show directly live. But the command mode interference has not changed that much. You can see that it has barely moved uh, be between the previous slide and this slide. So now we have to take care of the common mode interference. If you know Vert Electronic, you know that we are providing uh, common mode chokes. So here I added the LT Spice library for our common mode chokes, which can, which can be downloaded for free uh, on our website. And now in my uh, component selection in LT Spice, I've got the WECMB, which is um, our runner when it comes to the common mode chokes. So now I'm adding into my simulation a common mode choke, which is a XS version with one milli Henry uh, value. Um, then if I want to change the value, it starts to be tricky. So um, I made this little um, captures of the screen. So the first thing you do is you right click on your model that you put on your device, on your uh, simulation. Once you do the right click on your simulation, it will pop up a window. There is, you double left click here, and by doing a double left click, you will open a drop down menu. In this drop down menu, you can select the exact um, the exact common mode choke you'd like to sim you'd like to simulate. And once you have simul once you have inserted the common mode choke you want, you can enjoy the result. So this is without the common mode choke in the simulation. And now I will add the common mode choke into the simulation. So before the common mode choke and after I insert the common mode choke. And you see that the blue line, which is the contribution of the common mode goes down a lot. So we can do, we can fix the, the rest of the EMI signature, for example, with a common mode choke at the output, and it's up to you. If you want to experiment these examples, they will be available for download if you ask for them. So here, for example, we've managed to do, the, to do um, a breakdown of the common mode contribution and also of the differential mode contribution, and we acted exactly on what we wanted in the simulation. So um a very a question that i get very often and something that i'd like to do in the real life is the same thing so it's possible to do it in the in the real life but not with the regular um line impedance stabilization network most of the time um we have to use modified line impedance stabilization network that can output both lines a and b at the same time and by mixing together um these two signals we can have on one side the differential mode interference and on the other side the common mode interference. So if you are interested, it's possible to do it in the real life, not only in LT Spice. So here, for example, I'm using a STST, super tiny signal transformer from Virt Electronic, obviously. And here it is, uh, the view without the SMA connectors. So if you're interested, it can output you 
directly into, for example, here it's a picoscope. Um, the common mode contribution in red, I changed the colors and the differential mode contribution in blue. So yeah, it's possible to do it in the real life, but it's not as convenient to do it as it, as it is to do it in LTSpice. So now I think I'm already running out of time. Uh, so I just wanted to get quickly into some real life example. Uh, this is the example of the modeling of the flyback converter. The flyback converter um, is known to be a very, very good example of common mode interference uh, source. So here, um, what I'm doing here is I'm modeling the MOSFET uh, parasitic coupling of the tab. I'm modeling the transformer leakage inductance and the interwinding capacitance. That's the three basic contribution that I wanted to, to model into my simulation. And here is a an example, the differential mode flows in this way. And here, the common mode flows mostly in the parasitic uh, capacitive coupling. Here, for example, my heat sink is connected to the PE uh, conductor for safety purposes. And unfortunately, there is already a body diode in the, in the MOSFET, but another component comes for free it's the capacitor that is building up between the heat sink and the tab of my MOSFET, which is tied to the drain. And as you know, in flybacks, the drain is really a very dirty signal going from the plus rectified voltage down to almost zero and goes up again with a ringing, etc. So here I'm modeling the parasitic coupling um, capacitance with um, directly with a, with a capacitor of a few picofarads. The leakage inductance, which is the fraction of the, of the primary, which is not directly magnetically coupled together with the secondary, is given directly by the data sheet. So I just have to input this value, this maximum value, if I want to be in the worst case condition, uh, into my simulation. In LTSPICE, if you want, you can have here a little tool that enables you to model your transformer from LP, LS for the secondary and auxiliary here. You just input the turn ratio and then it will output output you the values you have to put into LTSPICE um, to have the actual um, to have the actual to have the actual um, values for simulation. And the next thing is the interwinding capacitance. So the interwinding capacitance um, comes from the fact that the primary and the secondary are, for example, um, capacitively coupled together. Uh, this can be understood from the winding build that you can request from us. And it's getting more obvious that we've got parasitic coupling between primary and secondary when looking at the construction of a transformer. So here, for example, the here is the secondary and here is the primary so you can definitively see that we will build up capacitance between this primary and this secondary so this has to be modeled into the simulation so here is the example uh, of the simulation and here is what you get when doing the simulation so again, you see that the differential is dominant into the low frequency range and then quite fast, the common mode becomes dominant again. And it fits, it fits quite well with the actual measurement that we can do in an EMC lab. So um, I think I'm running out of time. And uh, the last example was a brushless DC driver and motor, but I think it's already out of the timing to run the simulation. Another thing that I wanted to highlight is the fact that you can also set up uh, initial conditions because when you're re running EMC accurate simulations, it means that you have a lot of parasitic elements modeled. Having these parasitic elements modeled means that unfortunately the simulation can take a long time. 
So if you want the simulation to stabilize faster, to spend less time sim doing the simulation and running the simulation, then what you can do is to set up an initial condition. Well, for example, preload voltage into a capacitor, preload some current into an inductor. And this speeds up the, the simulation because you don't have to run the simulation for a few milliseconds before it gets to a stable, um, to a stable state, to a steady state. So, thank you very much. Um, I don't have exactly the time, but I think I'm in the timing. Uh, thank you for attending, and I will open the the questions um, just to see uh, what are the questions I can answer. Okay. So yeah, thank you, Silva, for this presentation. This really interesting um, part. So. Yeah, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions and we wait a little until some questions come in. You can ask us the questions via the chat function in the webinar control panel. Oh, I see so. questions coming in the panel. Okay. Um, um. Okay. So maybe we don't have, uh, yeah, we can't answer all your questions right now, but we will answer all of them via email afterwards. So, yeah. So I see a question, but it's rather related to the Van Vin loop testing. Um, so I will reply um, by email rather. Um, um, so we have emissions. Uh, on 30 megahertz to 50 megahertz range as 50 dB, can you suggest any practical solution? So the first thing I would suggest to you if you have emissions from 30 megahertz to 50 megahertz, it means that you are likely to be into radiated emissions. So if you're in radiated emissions, it means that it's an amount of signal that you put into an antenna. So from 30 to 50 megahertz, then the first thing you have to understand is which antenna is emitting. Most of the time, it's the, it's the power supply cable which is emitting between 30 to 50 megahertz. And then the next step is just to know, is it coming from a differential mode interference or a common mode interference? So plenty of solutions, but the first thing you have to understand is is it differential mode? Is it common mode? If it's differential mode, then just put uh, X capacitor into the terminal. If it's better, then it was differential. If it's not better, then it was common. If it was common, just snap ferrite on the cable. So um, by using a very simple methodology, you can uh, really get things better. So I will take this as done. Okay. okay. Uh, where can we find the equivalent circuit uh, splitter PCB board used for conducted emission. Um, yeah, um, I can provide it. Um, I can provide it, but it's uh, it's quite simple. It's just a, just a transformer. Um, so I will mark it as red. Uh, where can we download the presentation? So you can download the presentation in the document panel. Uh, in the webinar interface, and you will be able to access the replays um, of the presentation. Um, yeah, we will send you in the next week um, a link to the presentation as well as to the recording, so you will get the link from us. Okay. Um, what is the output of the FFT in LTSPICE? So the FFT in LTSPICE outputs you the RMS value. Um, so it's not it's not peak value, it's not quasi peak, it's RMS value. So it's quite close to it's quite close to average um, measurement that you get in an EMC lab. Um, ooh, plenty of questions, so I will not have time to answer them all. I uh, will pick another one. Um, mm, 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 mm. um, how 
how can LTSPY model losses with a frequency dependent like in RF bits? Um, so LTSPY's model the losses um, because we we have um, we have uh, an inductive behavior for the ferrite bits at the beginning, and then another behavior which is resistive dissipative behavior builds up. Um, if you download the latest um, LTSPICE models uh, into the from the website, um, you can have the model. But how can like in RFPs? Yeah. Oh, can LTSPICE model losses? Oh, so now this question, uh, it's, it takes a bit of time to answer, but I, I will reply to, to this question by email. Um, okay, could you show how to simulate LTSPICE in LTSPICE parameter of EMC filter? Um, okay, to simulate LTSPICE uh, EMC filter, um you can use okay just one second here for example what i'm doing in ltspice is the same thing as this and you can simulate um you can simulate um, a filter with ltspice using this kind of uh, this kind of uh, this kind of system you put your signal generator here and you put your source resistor, sync resistor, and you put your filtering element in the middle. You can do this for both differential mode and common mode uh, configurations. Okay, so I, I think I've got too much questions here to, to answer them all today. Uh, I'm just looking at questions asked several times. Um, mm -mm -mm. All the limit lines are calculated to values into FFT graphs. Uh, the limit lines are calculated uh, to values using the a piece of uh, a piece of spreadsheet here. So here you can see that I am calculating here with the power values. So I think you can see my screen. So what I'm doing here is using the start frequency the log value, the N frequency, and the log value. And this, from this data, we can get directly this. So this is how I, cal I calculate the limit lines from the specification value from the, from the regulation. So th this file, if you, want, uh, if you want to have it, just uh, drop us an email or put it into the comments uh, or in the question pane with your email address. Okay, so thanks for all your questions. I see that I will not have time to answer them all today if I want to stay in the in the time frame. Um, okay, so I will take time to answer each and every question that I've been asked into the into the question pane. Um, if you if you still have some questions, just uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, there is my email at the at the end of the um, at the end of the presentation. Okay, then thank you, Silver, for this presentation and for answering the questions or some of them. Yeah, as uh, you mentioned, we will answer all of your questions after the webinar uh, via email. So then we are finished with our webinar. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Also many thanks to you again, Silva, for this great webinar. Thank you. And thank you all the attendees. I hope you will hear us at our next webinar and I wish you a good day. Goodbye. Bye.